Good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us for CPUN's September uh, community meeting. Um, next slide, please, Mark. Uh, CPUN is the Registered Neighborhood Organization, or RNO, for the Central Park community in Denver. Uh, we are here to facilitate dialogue and create awareness around opportunities to engage on topics of importance to this community. Um, we help people to find their way into a process so that resident questions, concerns, and ideas for a better community can be addressed in a constructive and inclusive way. We promote public service, civil, civic discourse, and collective efficacy. Uh, and at monthly meetings like this one, and through the work of our six working committees, CPUN facilitates the discussion of key issues with neighbors, engages in proactive problem avoidance, and amicable problem solving. CFUN is committed to providing an inclusive and welcoming environment for all members of our community. Uh, we are an all volunteer board of your neighbors and a registered 501c3. Uh, tonight we have a full agenda. Um, our first hour will be dedicated to outreach. Um, we will have updates from our CPUN committees as well as our various community partners. And we have a special guest with us uh, this evening. Paul Lopez uh, will be joining us, Denver's clerk and recorder, who will be discussing the role of his office uh, with a specific focus on the upcoming election. We'll then conclude this portion of the meeting with public comment before pivoting to our uh, board meeting. Um, everyone that uh, is here is welcome to stay for the board meeting. Our board meeting is public and we do have a full agenda uh, with lots of interesting things to talk about. Um, one of those things that we have to talk about, uh, Mark, if you don't mind switching to the next slide, is a vote uh, on a new board member, Liz Stalnicker, who uh, presented her interest in the board uh, to us last month. We'll have a few brief committee reports before pursuing uh, digging into some potential bylaw changes, specifically the size of our board and the possibility of expanding our footprint to include um, residents of Aurora as well. Uh, we'll then move on to budget and address a couple of committee questions that um, uh, will help to streamline our operations and then uh, wrap up with a um, unique zoning case that I, I uh, wanna bring before the board. Uh, before we proceed, I just want to say a quick welcome back to Central Park's wonderful school communities who have all started a new school year since this board last met. Uh, thank you to everyone who plays a role in helping to grow and nurture our kids. And thank you to our uh, kids for teaching the adults a thing or two as well. I hope everyone's year is off to a good start. Um, with that, uh, we'll move on to committee updates. All of CPUN's committees uh, meet on a monthly basis to organize any number of initiatives. Uh, do any of the committees have any opportunities over the next month or 30 days-ish for community participation that they would like to share? Uh, looks like, Carol, you're on mute. Yeah, there I am. There I am. Yeah. Um... Just two committees, uh, the Safe Streets Committee, um, we've had an uptick in membership um, and in notification and questions from neighbors about accidents and dangerous drivers this month. And that's which is what I wanna focus on very briefly. Um, we have neighbors who are angry, they're fearful and they're compelled now to reach out um, for numerous means to mitigate speeding and reckless driving behavior. And this has led to a lot of activism on their part and they're sharing that with us. So we're gonna devote our meeting on October 5th at three o'clock to um, people reporting in about what they've witnessed and the actions that they've taken and creating some ideas um, to continue the activism to get things changed. And I did wanna do a little shout out to Jack and the MCA because one of the things that we found in one or two particular locations was vegetation that was blocking viewing and it was making it dangerous to drive. Yeah. And Jack jumped on that um, when Brad and I contacted him and they got some things cut back and I hope that's alleviated some of the problems, but it's just one issue um, in terms of safety. Uh, the education committee has changed meeting times. We're gonna meet at four o'clock on the second Tuesday of each month. And um, the community garden continues in terms of events and uh, we're building soil now. 
uh, a woman who, Beth, who is a member of the sustainability uh, committee has taken over the events for this community garden, which is at 49th place and you went to street um, in my side yard. And it's kind of turning out to be fun in terms of what they're doing there and having an event each month. Um, DPS board candidates of, I think there are nine that we would be interested in, four for district four and five for the at-large position have all been invited to our, our October meeting uh, to respond to questions. We've heard back from five. Um, so we're in the process of uh, formulating questions for that. Um, a letter was sent out today to Central Park Public Schools, uh, elementary schools in terms of offering support uh, for students and possibly families and staff. Um, I met uh, along with Jeff and Amanda, Brian Weber, who is the vice president, I wanna make sure I get all the words in, for education initiatives with the Foundation for Sustainable Urban Communities. And he's very interested in supporting the education committee and the DEI committee. And he and I are gonna meet um, early October, I think it will be. Um, so that is what I have from the committees. And just to let you know, I'm the INC delegate, the Interneighborhood um, co uh, Cooperation. And um, the focus this month was on information about good neighbor agreements. And they record all their meetings and we can get that up on the website for people to take a look at. So thank you. And thanks, Jack. Thanks, Carol. One that I'd like to share in the as we try to uh, identify opportunities for residents to engage over that next 30 days or before our next meeting is um, our inaugural uh, Central Park Fruit Harvest Project. You might have seen it mentioned in, in several newsletters, but our sustainability committee has been working in partnership with CU's, uh, CU Denver's Fast Lab to produce some really cool interactive maps where you can see the ways in which um, residents are uh, taking advantage of fruiting trees and bushes on their property. Uh, it includes um, recipes, um, guidance on what type of uh, fruiting trees and bushes grow best in this area, and a number of other ways to help, um, help you get started if that's something you're interested in. I encourage anyone that's interested in learning more or potentially participating to reach out to our um, sustainability committee. And if I don't mind, if, if no one minds, so would someone from that committee mind putting a, a bit of contact information in the chat? So that sure, I can do that. Out? Thanks, in a Mark. Second, um, I also wanted to add two quick notes um, as well. Uh, one is if you have fruit on a tree that you want somebody to harvest, we've actually found an organization that uh, will harvest that, uh, leave you some of the fruit, and then take the excess to a um, free uh, market that they run. Uh, metro carrying here in Denver for folks who can't afford uh, fresh fruits and veggies and whatnot. Um, so if you have anything like that, definitely let us know. Um, I'm putting my email address into the chat right now. And the other item I wanted to mention is that tomorrow is bike to work day because COVID sort of postponed everything. So if you want to find a place to get some uh, uh, free snacks, biking to work tomorrow, uh, go to bike to work day.co for Colorado, and you can find the different stations that are out there. Um, and I'll put that in the chat too. Workday.co. So yeah, that's it from the sustainability right now. Great. If there is nothing else <clears throat> pressing from any of the committees, I'm happy to move along to our uh, community partners. Going once. All right. We have a number of community partners who uh, uh, generously join us every month. And I want to start with Denver Police Department. Um, who do we have with us? I'm looking through the list. Sorry. Feel free to unmute and uh, go ahead and look back. Hello, can everybody hear me? Yeah. Hi, so I'm Officer Ferns. I am. I know you guys are used to Officer Jenkins and Lieutenant oh, hi. Hines. Um, I'm the community resource officer. My primary responsibility is in Mont Bello in Green Valley Ranch, but I am here in their place uh, today. They are both on vacation, enjoying themselves. So I'm here to answer any questions. Um, there's not too many updates. We do have a drug take back coming October 23rd. It's a Saturday from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. 
we'll get everybody more information on that as we get closer to those dates. Um, they're going to be at all the participating King Super locations in District 5, so 28 in Quebec, the one off MLK in Havana, and the one off Green Valley Ranch Boulevard and Tower, as well as the District 5 station. Um, we are just starting to plan Halloween, so more details to come on that, but that will be really fun. Big event that we do every year in partnership with Lincoln Tech. Um, so again, more details to come on that, but not much updates, but I'm here if you guys have any questions for me, any concerns, anything that I can bring back, um, I'm here. Thank you for uh, joining us, Officer Franz. Any questions? Let's see, do we have a representative from Councilman Herndon's office with us this evening? Looking for Amanda. Doesn't look like we do this month. Um, we also don't have a uh, our regular representative from Northeast Transportation Connections. They let me know that they wouldn't be able to make it. Uh, I'm really glad that Mark mentioned um, Bike to Work Day. That's one of the big events of the year that that organization um, uh, facilitates, uh, but they do a lot of really cool work and I encourage everyone to check them out. Again, it's Northeast Transportation Connections. I do see John from the library though, from Sam Gary. Uh, John, do you have any updates for us? There we go. <laughs> okay. Yes. Um, hello, everyone. Um, yeah, I've just got got a few um, few things to update on. Um, one thing uh, that uh, is kind of exciting is there. Um, we have a um, system wide uh, youth services steering committee, um, and we're looking for members. Um, the unfortunate thing is the deadline is tomorrow. Um, so I didn't know about this got announced in between the, the CPUN meetings. So um, I will put something, I'll put a link in the chat, but they're looking for adults and also uh, youths to um, be part of this to kind of um, help uh, kind of create the, the roadmap for um, all of Denver Public Library's uh, services to youth sort of the, it's like a three to five year plan. So um, it's a pretty cool thing. and. Uh, participants will also get um, gift cards for uh, attending the, the three, um, I think they're going to be virtual meetings. Um, so I'll put a link in the chat to that. Um, I think I mentioned at the last meeting that we um, had uh, resumed story times uh, outdoors um, at the Sam Gary Library. Um, and it, we kind of outgrew our initial spot and the MCA was kind enough to allow us to use the, uh, the green um, on 29th Avenue. Um, and so we've been having uh, over 100 uh, people attending those. So it's been really fun um, to be able to um, do story time again. That's, that's something that's always been uh, one of the most popular things at the Sam Gary Library. So um, we've been very excited about that. Um, and we've been able to get out in the community a little bit. Uh, I rode Wheelie, the, um, the uh, little mobile bike on wheels in Councilman Herndon's bike parade. And then this weekend, uh, my colleague Thane will be up at the, um, let's see, I believe it's called the, it's the Denver Century Ride. It's, uh, it's starting and ending uh, in Northfield. And so there are multiple uh, various length uh, bike races. And so he'll be up there representing the library and have a bunch of giveaways. Um, so we're pretty excited about that. Um, and then uh, system-wide, I wanted to mention that there will be a new uh, library opening up in Rhino. Um, yeah, it's the Art Park development. Um, and it, it got, it was supposed to be late September, but I think there was a little problem with uh, some of the inspections with the building. So we don't know the exact opening date, um, but yeah, we're looking for input on naming uh, that location. And that's, um, I'll put a link in the chat to that too. That's on our, our website. Uh, and they have, they are starting to do some outdoor programming there, even though the building isn't open yet. So uh, we are pretty excited about that. Um, but that's, those are kind of the, um, the main things that I wanted to touch on. Uh, we've, we've been uh, kind of, you know, increasing uh, 
slowly uh, people are kind of realizing libraries open again and, and we've been pretty busy. So we're excited. Our uh, circulation numbers, uh, checkouts are not quite what they were pre COVID, but they've, they've come almost back up to that point. Um, and we're only open five days a week right now. So it's, it's pretty amazing. I think the community was really missing the library and we're excited to be open again. Yeah, we're excited to have you back, John. Um, just to clarify that youth services program. So the idea is it's a um, pool of residents who will contribute to um, a three to five year plan. So it's kind of like an organizing uh, initiative to figure out what that might look like. Correct. And now this is the initial thing. It's 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 three meetings that um, the people that get selected for this, there's kind of an application process. Um, and uh, the, they're gonna, there's gonna be some library staff and then some members of the community, um, both young and old. And they're basically going to start developing the framework for what that uh, long-term plan would look like um, with a, a focus on um, inclusion and diversity um, and you know, meeting various, um, trying to make sure that all members of the community are being served equally and um, finding holes, gaps in services, things like that. Um, it's, a, it's kind of an ambitious, you know, they're trying to look at it uh, to, to really kind of map it out, um, to, to have a strong plan rather than, you know, take things year by year, kind of really come up with a good vision for it. So I will, um, like I said, I'll, I'll, I'll post that in the, in the link, but they're looking for um, people of all ages, basically. And you said it's a three meeting commitment? Three meeting commitment, yes. Great. Um, to those listening, I've, I've sat on similar things within transportation and as well as um, early childhood education. If the work of the library is something that you're interested in, these sorts of um, opportunities can be really interesting ways to get to interface with um, city agencies and understand a little bit about a little bit more about how they work and, and how decisions get made. Uh, it's a cool opportunity. I'd encourage anyone that's interested to, to try it out. Thanks, John. Thank you. Um, Mercy Housing. Um, I think Sarah, are you able to join from your phone there, Sarah? Yep, yep, I'm here. Hey. I don't have the video on because I'm currently walking the dog, so y'all get motion <laughs> sick, so I apologize. That's okay. Um, yeah, so um, not really too many updates since last time. Um, the, um, the like, um, the monthly donation day is always the Thursday before this meeting. Um, and that's how it was scheduled. So that kind of makes it a little easier to remember just the Thursday before we have this meeting. Um, if people have donations, I mean, clearly you're not expected to. It's just that was the day that was set. Um, and then um, Ellen and Aaron shared with me a Amazon list um, that was put together before I started. And then I've been tinkering around with it a little bit, but I'll definitely share that. When I'm not on my phone. I don't know how to do it from my phone. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> um, but yeah, it's predominantly cleaning, um, like cleaning supplies and um, like bath, like um, shampoo, soap, body wash, toothpaste, um, those kind of items. I threw a couple of fun things on there. Um, but yeah, just kind of the stuff that residents need, but are not able to get with food stamps. Um, that's always the big thing with why um, cleaning items are always in such high need. Um, oh, sorry, one sec, my dog got a sticker in his foot. Um, there we go. Um, but yeah, I will most definitely share the link with that as soon as I'm able to. Um, I think those are kind of my, my big updates. We don't have any, oh, there is that community event. The, um, it's on October 6th. Um, it's a virtual event. I believe Jeff, I believe you got an invite. Um, yeah, the variety show fundraiser. Yeah. 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 Um, but I feel like those are kind of the big updates. We don't have anything crazy. I'm still pretty new. So I'm still kind of getting to know the ropes and meet all the residents and kind of learn how, how things go. Um, but does anybody have any questions or anything that they were wondering about, about the property? Um, Sarah, if you want to send uh, the Amazon list to me over email, we can make sure to get that posted and distributed. Oh, wonderful. I might have to do that. Um, yeah. I did send it to my home email, so I have access to it from home, but I don't know how to do it in Zoom on a telephone. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. That's okay. Um, 
but yeah, but do, does anyone on the, on the group, is there any questions or things that you've kind of been wondering about? I don't think so. Not, I'm not here. Uh, I'm, I'm speaking on behalf of the group here, Sarah, only because you're on the phone. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm not seeing yeah, no, that's okay. I'm just not seeing any comments or anything. <laughs> I guess I'll ask one. Is there a need for like young child's toys at all? So in general, yes. But unfortunately, because of COVID, we can only take new items, kind of like at Children's Hospital. They can only take new items. Um, so that's just kind of a, on, how's, what's the word? Unfriendly COVID thing. Um, but once COVID calms down, I'm willing to bet we'll be able to take used items again. Um, when the world situation is a little better. <laughs> well, thanks, Sarah. I appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Um, our last community partner is the MCA, um, who, of course, handles the community's pools, parks, and programming, as they like to say. But I don't see Diane with us. Um, Jack, is there anything from the NCA that you feel comfortable sharing? I will invite everyone to our weekly farmer's market every Sunday at Founders Green. That's at uh, 29th and Roslyn Street in the town center. It runs from 9 a.m. to uh, 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. every Sunday. Uh, our last market will be October 10th. And we look forward to re resuming our uh, annual pumpkin harvest uh, at our October 10th farmer's market as well. Uh, otherwise, if you ever have any concerns or uh, other questions regarding the community, you can always feel free to reach out to us uh, on our website. That's mca80238.com. Uh, or you can send us an email, info at mca80238.com. Uh, issues relating to landscaping, our parks, our Pools are closed for the season, but uh, any programmatic or other concerns you might have, uh, we are happy to receive those and get you answers to any of your questions. Perfect, thanks, Jack. Any questions for the MCA? All right, if not, we can move on to our um, special guest. I'm very excited uh, to welcome uh, clerk and recorder Paul Lopez uh, to join us tonight. Uh, his office serves a number of important functions for the city and county of Denver, including administering elections, preserving various records, and then making them available to the public, uh, recording land transactions and overseeing foreclosures, among other things. He's here tonight to talk primarily about uh, the upcoming uh, election, and um, we're we're really lucky and grateful to have him join us uh, this evening. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, do you have um, any slides you want to share, Paul? Um, I let me check. I wanted to make sure. Sometimes, uh, sometimes we do. Sometimes we don't. <laughs> based off of you know how much time we have. You uh, have, we're actually running ahead of schedule, so you got plenty of time. Oh, okay. We never um, run ahead of schedule. So before I do, before I do that, I do want to acknowledge uh, uh, Brandy Michelle, and um, some of you may already know Brandy, and Brandy is um, one of my engagement specialists. She actually does a lot of the heavy lifting in terms of, you know, doing the uh, doing a lot of our community outreach, community engagement. Uh, she's done some policy work with us. So it's really, you know, I'm really lucky to, to have Brandy. Brandy uh, used to be in the, in the Council District 8 office uh, back in the day. So Brandy, I, I want to make sure you can say hi. <clears throat> Thanks, Clerk. Um, and thank you all for know. having us tonight. Appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah, and, and we also have um, Amy Bernabé Jimenez, who uh, or Amy Bernabe Jimenez, who also uh, works on the engagement team in our uh, in our office. It's one of the new things that we've done um, uh, since becoming elected. I uh, one of the needs that I uh, observed, but also one of the priorities was to make sure that this this world class world, I mean, and 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 nationwide leading model for elections is true in every single zip code in our own city. 
And that's making sure that we have access, no matter what zip code you live in, no matter what ability you have. And so we've been very aggressive in um, expanding the locations of drop boxes, um, expanding access. And part, part of that is making sure we're getting into every nook and cranny of the city. Not everybody's on Twitter, not everybody um, is, is on Facebook or, or, or online even, you know, that digital divide does truly exist, especially with our uh, aging population, especially with folks who uh, have different abilities and also with folks who are new to the country and new citizens, right? Believe it or not, um, not everybody has a smartphone. Um, I miss my Samsung little e, E105, the kind that you flip and put it in your pocket. I miss that so much. Um, <clears throat> I sometimes I can't deal with you. Oh, shoot, you can't even see my phone. I promise it's here. Um, so I do want to just, just to recognize my staff, and I appreciate you, you all. Um, uh, so I do. I want to talk about the election that we have uh, coming up. It's the coordinated election on November 2nd. Um, so, so those of you that, that know, we have a coordinated election uh, coming up, and we are, we're E minus 42. So we are 42 days out from the last day to vote. And that's typically what we um, uh, say nowadays because of the fact that you are able to vote um, starting when, mail, when, when our mail ballots are sent to you. Everybody gets a mail ballot if you are registered and active in this city. Um, that, that mail ballot will get to you uh, probably Saturday, October 9th. Um, they're gonna be mailed out on October 8th. So some of you actually may get it on uh, October 8th. So you have from October 8th all the way to 7 p.m. on uh, November 2nd. Yeah, the Los Muertos, the last day to uh, vote. Um, you should you know, take steps now to make sure that you receive your, your ballot at home. And you can do that very easily. You just get on uh, denvervotes.org and uh, update your, uh, your, your information. If you get on ballottrace.org, so ballottrace.org allows, it's a platform in which you are able to track your ballot from it being printed and mailed to you to us receiving it and accepting it for counting. So um, it is a really cool piece of technology and actually, you know, uh, reassures voters uh, that, you know, of that process. And it's a little bit of technology to, to, to be a part of that. In other parts of the state, uh, it's called Ballot Tracks, but it originated in Denver and it's ballottrace.org. So make sure you go on, sign up, double check your information. It doesn't hurt to do so. That way you're not uh, uh, blitzing at the last moment um, if you didn't get it um, or if it was sent to a, a wrong address. Um, you know, we try to keep on top of everything, but the best way that we can do it is you all being able to do that. So um, <clears throat> we are in election mode now. Sept, uh, September 17th, uh, our UACABA, our overseas uh, ballots were uh, transmitted, um, you know, uh, approximately 1100% by mail, and then uh, 4,061 sent via email. And so that way, you know, for the folks who are uh, living abroad, Americans living abroad, Denverites living abroad, um, they're able to, uh, to vote with, uh, with plenty of time. A um, couple of dates to remember. The uh, October 8th is when we mail your ballot out to you. Um, uh, October 1st is when our municipal information booklet and our table no Tabor notice is mailed to you. So you can you know, really take the time to read through that, study the issues on your ballot. Um, we have a pretty heavy ballot. Um, we have, I think, um, let me see, I'm counting right now. Uh, for countywide questions, um, which is Denver, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven different uh, countywide questions, and then you have um, Proposition One Nineteen and Proposition One Twenty, and also uh, Proposition. I mean, sorry, Amendment Seventy Eight. So um, it is going to be a packed ballot. You're also going to have um, one that is uh, referred by petition. That's uh, 2F. Um, you're also, depending on where you live, are going to be able to vote for your school board member. Um, there's gonna be one at large 
and there's going to be various uh, that are that are districts the school board members district four three and two i believe are going to be on the ballot so historically speaking you know we've you know for a coordinated election you really don't have that much turnout in 2015 it was 35 percent 17 it was 35 percent again 2019 right before the pandemic it was uh, 39%. We almost hit 40%. I'd say that we're going to be around closer to 42, 44% this time. And I say that because, you know, we happened to run a pretty crazy election, crazy election cycle in 2020. Um, and in that election cycle, we saw uh, an 86% turnout, which is the second highest turnout in Denver since 1992, which was the, um, uh, uh, I think President Clinton was elected in 92. And also uh, because of the, you know, I think we were probably a 33, no, about 300,000 people less in Denver. So um, it was it was a lot different. But uh, we also, you know, in 2020 had the largest return on of ballots uh, that were other than voting in person. And those of you who know, I mean, I think it was like 94 percent. Of folks that didn't vote in person, they usually use a drop box or just mailed it in. Four ways to vote. Three typically, but uh, uh, four, uh, if we're counting an innovation that we have. First way is just mail that ballot back as soon as you, you know, study those issues, study those candidates. When you're able to uh, fill that ballot out, pop it back in the mail, we get it. Another opportunity for you is to just drop it in a drop box. We have 40 of them around the city. Uh, I think the nearest one in Central Park is at the Central Park Rec Center. Um, and also at the Central Park uh, offices, um, I believe. So um, we will send your, your location in your instructions that come with your ballot as well, too. Um, you can vote in person. We're going to have 11 sites uh, all throughout the city that you can actually, you know, what we call a voting, polling and service center. Um, we're gonna have two um, uh, mobile units that are gonna be deployed throughout the city um, so that you're able to, to do that as well too. There are mobile vote centers. We've increased that by one. Um, we actually showed off during the all-star game and uh, parked it right across the street from the stadium almost and so, you know, just showing that bad boy off and uh, just getting people acquainted with it. Um, and then the third way is, I mean, I'm sorry, the, the fourth way um, is you could also come curbside. A lot of our uh, VSPCs, you can drop off your ballot and do some and do curbside. Um, you, you know, for more information on that, you can hit us up at denvergov.org. Uh, I'm sorry, denvergov, denvervotes.org. I was telling you my, the last part of my email address. Um, it's actually pretty cool. And, you know, it's an innovation that we had in 2020. Um, we figured how if people can do curbside margaritas, you can do curbside ballot service. Right. And I, and from what I could tell, there's still curbside margaritas. So we're going to keep our curbside ballots. Um, the other thing uh, that we're going to be doing, um, because we are still in a pandemic, we are not post pandemic, we are still in a pandemic. I'm requiring that all of our election judges, all of our staff, all of our elections personnel uh, continue to have our 2020 um, uh, COVID safety protocols. So we're gonna be masking up, um, whether you're vaccinated or not. Um, we're gonna be disinfecting our uh, uh, pans and workstations and things like that. And we're gonna be uh, minding some social distance regulations. Also because you know that variant is still out there and I am very protective of our personnel and also the public. That's just our duty is, is, is public health, right? And I think, uh, you know, until this pandemic is over, we're going to do our best to, to, to curb that spread. Um, so that's, that's that. Um, so again, Dropbox, mail, in person, and uh, curbside. Now remember, we're not doing margaritas. But just remember, curbside margarita, curbside ballot. I don't know if folks have questions. Um, you know, uh, just a I couple. I do more. have one follow-up question. If that's all right. Um, good to see you out here, clerk. Uh, um, nice I haven't seen you in a while. It's good to, to run you, unfortunately. You don't change, wow. man. You don't change. <laughs> he looks the same he did 13 years ago. <laughs> um, 
So uh, my question is, one of the things that tri tends to trip people up when it comes to elections, especially lower turnout ones, is getting registered and making sure they're registered. Um, obviously, anybody who's already registered, it sounds like is going to get a ballot. But what are the easiest ways for particularly new residents in our area to be able to get registered? Um, uh, hit us up, denvervotes.org. Um, and there are links to, to the statewide registration. It's so easy to register to vote. Um, you could also go to govotecolorado.gov uh, or is it .org? Brandy, I keep messing that up. Amy, I think it's .gov. .gov. Yeah. And so that's the Secretary of State's office. Yeah, like I said, um, hit us up at denvervotes.org and you're going to see not only an opportunity to make sure that you're registered to vote, um, but also just a lot of helpful information for folks that are living in Denver, if you're new to Denver, uh, kind of what to expect. Um, so yeah, it, it's so easy. Um, and by the way, we are now at 503,000 registered voters in Denver. That's the most in our history. And we eclipsed that in 2020. So high five. Um, you can vote, by the way, you can um, register to vote all the way to uh, 7 p.m. on election day. You have seven, you have um, same day voter registration. The Any other, other thing, I'm oh, sorry, go ahead. Any other questions? So the link is there, um, Amy, thank you for putting that in there. Um, the link is there for folks that want to uh, do some voter registration. I, I have to say a couple more things, right? Um, one is that, um, you know, if, if we recommend that you uh, put this in your calendar, if, if you're one of those folks that likes to, you know, kind of really wait and, and see how these issues play out and, you know, hear the debates and all that stuff, um, we recommend that um, folks put their ballots in the mail if they're going to mail them uh, by Friday, October 26th to make sure that we receive it by 7 p.m. on election day. Otherwise, you can just drop it in a drop box. Um, it's so easy. It's so secure. It's super transparent. I'm going to tell you right now, I know there's a lot of, um, uh, I know there's a lot of crap out there, of, you know, trying to really discredit what we do, trying to vilify um, elections officials, trying to vilify election judges. These are your neighbors, your fellow citizens. These are people doing their civic duty. Um, we, you couldn't, you could not uh, vote or live in a in a more secure and transparent environment. This democracy is absolutely solid. Um, I've taken an oath as your clerk um, to ensure that that's the case, and we will continue to do that. Thank you, uh, clerk. I know that uh, elections are your primary focus at the moment. Uh, and of your office overall. But do you mind sharing just a little bit about some of the other work that your office does and how um, what people can learn uh, from, from your office? Yes, absolutely. And I, I think I saw Amanda raise her hand. Oh, I'm sorry, Amanda. I'm sorry. Yeah, it was quick. You had already started talking. Um, I was wondering, I, um, Clark Lopez, Lopez, you seem like someone who would be involved with the redistricting in the city. Is that something, how, how much of a role does your office have with those efforts? I appreciate that question. And um, we don't do redistricting. Uh, my office has, uh, uh, does not, uh, it's not our duty to do re redistricting by charter. That's the uh, legislative branch on the city council. However, um, we are in charge of reprecincting. So once those congressional lines are drawn, and decided upon uh, once those house district lines are, are drawn and decided upon. Um, and that when I say decided upon I me mean going through the courts and all that, and, and they've ruled on the final uh, lines, we have the uh, lovely task of reprecincting. And the, all those precincts, you know, I think statutorily we can go up to 2,000 people per precinct. Um, so we're trying to figure out, so we, we will redraw those precinct boundaries. And then once those precinct boundaries are drawn, um, city council can then begin to um, uh, look at um, council districts and draw city council district maps. So uh, once that takes place, um, it'll it'll be a legislative change. But our job is is as simple as just law and math and figuring out um, and making sure that every Denver voter is represented. 
um, in a precinct and that those precincts are final. We are already, um, because of that census data that was released, we match that census data with a known universe, with those census blocks um, of registered voters. Um, and we uh, de determine the size of each precinct, the boundaries of the precinct, and making sure that um, folks can participate in the election in Denver County. I appreciate that question on that. And I think city council has um, its own website and, and, and everything available for folks that wanna participate in the redistricting uh, process. Thanks, and it's a sort of getting at um, what I was asking about, uh, Clerk Lopez, which is um, other things that your office does that um, the community be benefits from that they can uh, learn about through your office. Yeah, I'm glad you asked that. Um, you know, uh, so elections, obviously. The other thing is we uh, we we record uh, county documents, um, release deeds of trust, um, and marry folks. Uh, so we process uh marriage and and civil union applications um we also so that's our, our county record recording um the other thing is our office of the public trustee um which is another function in colorado most almost all of the 64 counties um with the exception of denver um the public trustee is the treasurer denver the public trustee is the clerk um because it has to do with recording that's why in denver when you go try to figure out your license plate issues, um, it's not the clerk, it's the treasurer, right? So um, thank God that I don't have license plates. Oh my God, I'd be the most hated man in the world if I ran the DMV. I swear, um, I don't know what I would do. You would not see any hair on my head. I'd have bags under my eyes and I would be a grumpy, uh, grumpy individual if I had to run the DMV. However, um, hats off to the DMV because I think they're doing a good job given the pandemic. So, um, so remember, uh, county recording marriages, um, public trustee, and the public trustee's job is to ensure that the foreclosure process is run fairly. Um, it is a, a publicly oversight entity. Um, in other states, the public trustee is a third-party private entity. So that has to do with a lot of the history of Colorado and history of land swindling and all that other stuff. And, you know, I, I hate to say this, but um, that's not the past. And that's why I exist as the, your public trustee is to make sure that that process is fair. Remember this when I talk about foreclosures. A foreclosure notice is not game over. There are a lot of steps and processes that people can utilize um, to avoid that foreclosure and stay in their home. However, it's a very intimidating and it's a very um, complex process. And what we try to do is make it simple. So on our website, you'll see denverclerkandrecorder.org or go to Mile High Clerk, hashtag Mile High Clerk or at Mile High Clerk. You'll see that we've had a series of town halls um, as we're doing one tonight actually on how to prevent foreclosures. And usually foreclosures are a symptom of another issue financially, financial distress. So we've partnered with other entities of the city to make sure that people have access to that information. So far, uh, because of the moratorium on foreclosure, we are expecting an uptick, but it's a slow uptick. Um, our job is to not take sides or not take legal advice or give legal advice. We can't, we are the umpire. And so we're calling strikes and balls, right? So that's that. And then the other sexy thing that we do is um, as your city clerk, I uh, have the privilege of having to sign every single contract that comes through the city. <laughs> I have to um, be the steward of all of our city records. Um, anything that is an ordinance, any change to an ordinance, a chart, that any, we are the stewards of our city charter or city constitution. Um, I found some old ones from way back in the day, literally and some obscure shelves and then I had to blow that dust off of it. And you know what? Even in the 1800s, you had to remove snow off of your sidewalk, and that was the homeowner's responsibility. So uh, um, I, I'm, I'm proud to be your clerk. I, I, I love doing this. Um, and, you know, those are the, the separate functions. And you see right here behind me on our city clerk elections, public trustee records. If you want to get married, if you're facing foreclosure, um, if you 
are wanting to access a city record, or if you want to vote, hit us up. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, thank you. For, oh, sorry, was someone else trying to ask a question? It's Jack, Jeff. Uh, yeah, go ahead, Jack. My question for the clerk about recording documents. I know I get to come and see you guys there at the web building. Uh, not too frequently uh, with my, my other role at the MCA, I, I have the privilege of being the guy who gets to drive downtown to record documents all the time. So right. I know that process well. Um, we have um, our, essentially we've broken the Central Park neighborhood into uh, 57 different filings. There are subdivisions now. Um, and last year when we changed the name of the neighborhood, and subsequently the mayor changed our statistical neighborhood name, city council changed the name in the planning documents, but all of our subdivision filings uh, still show the word Stapleton on them. Uh -huh. I'm wondering what the process would look like to officially change the name and everybody's, you know, the deed of everyone's home still says the word Stapleton on it and how we can get that transferred over to Central Park. You know what? That is um, something I did. I, I really, really appreciate you bringing that up because, you know, um, that's our role. So let me let me look at what that process would look like because with all those different subdivisions you have so many different properties you have descriptions you have a lot of different legal documents that are tied to that the 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 good thing about the neighborhood is that um you know prior to it being the neighborhood it was just an airport right so i think you know what we can you know we don't have to go back into the 1800s to kind of figure this out we can go into recent time so let me figure out what that would entail because what we'd like to do is partner up with you all, um, because I think it's really important for there to be community ownership. And that is something I am glad to do. So um, Mr. Seward, let, let us uh, look into that, what it would take um, if we have to redact information of if, if anything, and you know every single one of those records, um, what it would take to actually do that. I think we'd also have to, uh, uh, coordinate with the assessor as well too um and and, so, and with, with some of those documents so yeah, thank you for question. bringing that up because yeah. that's critical that's absolutely critical i appreciate yeah, thank it. you thank you jack for asking that question um do, uh clerk Lopez and your staff do you mind sharing some email addresses or or other contact information in the chat where people might be able to reach out to you Great, thank you. Uh, Clerk Lopez and your staff, thank you again for joining us. It's much appreciated. That's um, important work that your office does. And I also wanna thank all of our uh, community partners who join us on a monthly basis. If you are doing bike to work day tomorrow, be sure to check out uh, some stations that the um, Northeast Transportation, Transportation Connections has set up. They're going to be at Central Park Rec Center, at Stanley Marketplace, and at the 29th Street Town Center. They usually have breakfast burritos and things like that there, so uh, do go check them out. Um, we are a little bit ahead of schedule, but we can kind of, I think we can turn to um, public comment. Uh, does anyone have a, a comment they would like to make? Amanda's son says no comment. <laughs> no? I see it's a like hand. You got oh, I'm sorry. I see a hand. Uh, Kenneth. Yeah, hi. Good evening. Um, and thanks so much for uh, giving me some time uh, to speak. Um, and thank you. Uh, Clerk Lopez for the work that you're doing to ensure everyone has a vote. Um, I'm a, actually a resident of um, Central Park in the Bluff Lake neighborhood. I live here with my wife and uh, two sons. And I'm here to uh, speak with you today um, about the Empower Northeast Ballot Initiative, Initiative 302, um, speaking about the, uh, the crowded ballot. Um, how much time do I have? I just want to make sure I'm respectful of, of your- Yeah, we, just, we have just five minutes uh, of public <clears throat> comment period okay. total. Great. Uh, I should be able to go through this pretty quickly. Um, so I just want to um, encourage everyone to vote yes on Initiative 302. It is actually a direct response to a measure, another measure on the, on the ballot 
um, that we believe is is misnomered and, and removes the voice of a local community by giving um, a citywide vote um, or requiring a citywide vote. Uh, for what happens related to the Park Hill golf course. Um, I am uh, one of the um, owners of the golf course, and we believe that um, this community-wide uh, initiative should um, is important because it ensures that local neighborhood has the power to determine the future of that defunct privately owned golf course. The community surrounding the golf course has um, expressed a need for diverse, affordable housing, a grocery store and open space, and they should have the loudest voice about what happens in their neighborhood and how to use this property to better their community. We don't let Cherry Creek residents decide what um, happens in Central Park and vice versa, and city voters shouldn't have veto power over this neighborhood. Um, the fact that taxpayer dollars were involved in this in the um, Park Hill Golf Course is a red herring. Federal dollars, as you all know, were involved in the former airport where the Central Park community now sits. And uh, did we have to ask Texas or California for permission to redevelop it? No, we, we don't. Um, Initiative 302 protects the voice of Northeast Park Hill by more clearly defining a conservation easement in Denver law. This measure doesn't change anything about state conservation easements or reduce land protections um, that are in place. It means that the majority non-white neighborhoods surrounding the golf course get to go through a planning process to determine what it wants without the threat of a citywide veto, just like every other piece of property in the city. Um, we don't want to set a dangerous precedent for citywide voters to have veto power over any local neighborhood issue, let alone uh, one uh, in Northeast Park Hill. Equity requires that we elevate voices that have been marginalized in the past, not overrun them. Um, so with that, I encourage you to vote yes on Initiative 302 um, to protect local choices and protect local voices. And I will put in the chat um, a link to our website for you guys to learn more and happy to answer any questions. I don't know if you guys um, have that or not. Yeah, we can do questions or comment, uh, okay. reciprocal comment or, or responses, I should say, uh, during public comment. Um, but thank you for joining us. Um, thank you. Thank you for the time. We have two minutes left if anybody else has uh, anything they'd like to say in, in the uh, public comment period. Hi, Jeff. <clears throat> this is Sheila McDonald. Hi, Sheila. Hi, how are you? Good, how are you? Good. I actually live in the Montclair neighborhood, um, which is just a little bit south of you. And uh, I am a native of Denver, and I grew up in the city and went to school here and uh, actually played in the parks. I'm, at, I'm talking today about Initiative 301, which protects the conservation easement on the Park Hill Golf Course. Uh, for those of you who have lived here a while, we voted for that conservation easement, the whole city did, and we paid for $2 million for it. It's not a question of other people controlling green space, it's a question of what kind of city we wanna live in. Northeast Park Hill, Northeast Denver is 10 degrees hotter than Hilltop, for instance. We need green space and everybody needs it. The 302, we're asking people to vote no on that. And for the simple reason is that that's a developer backed initiative that they paid $268,000 to get nine signatures on to try to change the language of the conservation easement so that they could develop Park Hill Golf Course. We are for a community process for what that land should be, but we're saying it should not be 155 acres of concrete. I don't think the community wants that. We've been endorsed by Greater Park Hill Neighborhood Association, Wellington Webb, Dennis Gallagher, people from across the city, and um, Penfield Tate, who lives in the neighborhood, uh, Representative um, Leslie Herod is supporting us. So we've done a lot of outreach in the neighborhood and people want it as green space. So I hope you vote yes on 301 and no on 302. Thank you for your time. That concludes our public comment period. Um, I'm going to encourage the board to take our uh, five minute break and we can um, start our board uh, meeting at the uh, bottom of the hour. Uh, thank you again to everyone that's joined us tonight. Anyone that's interested in listening in is more than welcome. Thank you, Jeff and the committee. 
Thank you. Thank you. I see Sandra, you're back. Welcome back everybody. I think we've got most people back here. All right, we ready to do, uh, get started? Let's do back? it. Let's do it. All right. Thanks, Jay. Let me make sure. I want to make sure Brian and 
Brian and Carol, are you there? Shalise? I'm here. I'm here. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Great. I'm here. All right. Well, why don't we get started? Um, the first agenda item I have is to vote on our open board seat. Um, we have one open board seat and we have one resident who has um, expressed interest and that's Liz. She submitted her letter uh, stating that interest and, and also joined us for our most recent uh, meeting in August um, where she uh, went through, got to introduce herself, do a little Q and A, that kind of thing. Um, and so I think we're ready to, to vote. I wanna make sure, I always look to Brian and Mark to make sure I'm doing this right. I, I think we simply need to nominate and then second the, uh, the candidate, is that right? Yep, I move. I'll second. And then just ask Are, if there's any objections, yeah. Are there any objections? I sure hope Jamie, your daughter, has not come in to object. Say so, yes. <laughs> yes. Okay, okay, good. All right. Um, all in favor of uh, having Liz Stolnicker join our board? Raise aye. Your hand, aye. You, you, you did that when you asked for no objections, Jeff. Oh, yeah. fair enough. The, the assumption wanted, is everyone's okay with it. T's and I's, just making just sure. making sure. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I think that's unanimous. Uh, Liz, welcome to our board. Thank you for your uh, commitment to working in our community. Well, thank, thank you all. I'm looking forward to working with you. Yeah, it's a bit. Is it too early to recruit her for specific committees? Uh, well, that's where we're- I'm already on a committee. But... That's right, she is. She's on DEI. Yeah. <laughs> that does but bring ha us Happy to join the outreach committee as well. I've been kind of uh, itching to, to join that. Well, we're happy to have you because I know the social media stuff, we have a lot of questions for you. Um, Thank that, you. Does, that does bring me to um, committee updates, whereas in the um, outreach meeting, we're talking about opportunities to participate. Um, this portion is more about kind of the how, how, how the board can help any of our uh, individual committees if there's any questions that need answering, that kind of thing. Um, I have a few that I want to uh, get out of the way quickly if, if the group doesn't mind. Um, one is, uh, thanks to Mandel, we have a great um, promotional uh, collateral piece for CPUN now that's um, ready to go. Um, and we've got budget to spend on printing it. Do we have any events in the next, say before the end of the year, um, where we could use those. Um, uh, my, my concern is printing off a bunch of them and then having them sit in my basement uh, for, for three months. Out, outreach potentially has one in the form of a, a welcome bag project that I don't wanna to spend too much time on tonight. Um, but um, if there are others, um, uh, I'd like to know so that we can get a sense of quantity. To, to potentially order. You're just talking about any events that might be coming up. Yeah, I, and, and I know with COVID, it's it's tough to plan on the, those kinds of things. Um, I'm still trying to get in touch with Bear, who runs the um, Raven Dance Group, and ah. his. I mean, the update from him was that he wasn't sure if his dancers were prepared to perform because they haven't been able to practice together for the last year because of COVID. Okay. So they are out of practice and he wasn't, he didn't know that they would be comfortable. So I have a couple of calls into him and I'll keep reaching out to him. He was just going to meet with them and see what they said, but there might be a delay on that too because of COVID. Well, that was the next thing I wanted to ask about was um, for the board, any board members that might not know, um, Brian Weber from the foundation said that this was a project, the Indigenous Dancers event that um, he'd like to help fund um, and that the MCA uh, is willing to help in terms of providing space as well. So I think we can get close to zero in terms of budget expenditures with that event. Um, uh, but we obviously need, just need to get the, the details together. So Jamie, is it okay with you if I just tell Brian that um, uh, we're 
not quite ready with that one yet and that we'll maybe look at more of a springtime event is that fair to say i, I just assume give that outdoors is preferable yeah i mean and i'll talk i'll sh i'll really try to get a hold of them this week and i could even ask the other thing that might be interesting and valuable is just um they do stories as well like they usually tell cultural stories and then perform dances mm -hmm. and i could ask if he if they could just do stories, if they're not like ready to dance and perform, maybe they would just share stories. And um, I think that would be really also valuable, you know, with yeah. um, Indigenous, you know, People's History Month coming up and everything. So okay. um, let me, I, I'll really, really try and get a hold of him this week. Sure. If I can. Okay, I'll just sit tight for a week or so, uh, Jamie. And then if you want to get back to me with any update, I'll, I can relay that to Brian then. And Jeff, just so you know, I the way I did it on the budget was I called out DNI donations and then put a line for the DNI events, and they basically just offset each other. So that's how I show it in the budget. Okay. Um, the uh, the next thing I want to ask about was October outreach. Um, the outreach committee organized the guest for August and September. Uh, Carol, thank you for doing so in October on behalf of uh, the education committee. Um, we chatted about this briefly over email, but I think um, getting confirmation from you on how much time you'll think you need is kind of the big thing so that I can um, relay any modifications to the outreach agenda for to our um, community partners specifically. You're muted. Sorry, I can't see Carol. Pardon me. Um, we had five RSVPs so far. Conceivably, there could be nine, but I don't think there will be. Um, and that obviously is going to um, impact time because if we just have five, we'll have a little bit more, more time. I did ask for, and I don't have my notes in front of me for that. I asked them to respond by a certain date Mm -hmm. So that you would know ahead of time um, for just that reason, for planning and also for formulating questions. Okay. Well, if you want to, um, however you want to do it, Carol, but setting a deadline so that an agenda can be put together. Yes. And, and then when, I can. When would you like that? Um, I'd like to give the community partners at least, um, well, there's two, two considerations. One is making sure that um, it's promoted properly through our uh, emails that, Mar that Mark sends out. So certainly no later than our regularly scheduled first email of the month of October so that that gets included there. Okay. Um, and then if we could have uh, at least a couple of weeks to let the community partners know if, if, I, if they're gonna have reduced or um, cut time or anything like okay. that. For the, for the rest of the board, when we've had candidates forums in the past, we've often just dedicated the entire outreach hour to that um, topic, which if we have the uh, number of candidates necessary to justify that, or if we feel like the five candidates that we have uh, is sufficient to justify that, we can do here as well. Uh, and Carol, I think your, your thoughts on how you'd like to see that hour or that portion of the meeting anyway ran would be um, would be welcome, and then we can kind of figure out how we want to balance out the time. Okay. Great. And then the last thing I'll just mention is that uh, on behalf of the outreach committee that we're getting the uh, survey together. Uh, of course, every uh, DEI did their own survey this summer, and I'm looking forward to hearing what, <laughs> what results they have once they've compiled that data. But this will be the multi-topic community-wide survey, and it'll be the first one that we've done since early 2019. Uh, so we're a bit overdue. Um, and I've gotten the questions that I think committees are prepared to submit. Um, and over the next month or so, um, outreach will be organizing uh, an updated community survey that we can then kind of circulate to uh, outreach and or through the outreach committee to the rest of the board for, for everybody's feedback that wants to offer it. Mark, any other thoughts on the 
survey piece? Um, no, I think we can take care of the rest of it in committee, though. You had a comment about bags, and I wasn't sure if you wanted to talk about that tonight at all. Or yeah, I don't think. Uh, yeah, I think I'll correct. hold on that one just in the interest of time. I had a, a follow up question to your question about when about any events that we might have regarding the um, uh, the literature piece that we have put together. Um, I, I know you had talked to Diane Dieter about the MCA's event process, but I wasn't sure what next steps were there about, you know, whether um, CPUD needed to, to be involved or in, in that and if outreach and communication should be or if we should expect to, you know, or if there was like a, you know, anything next happening with that, if we're going to start having uh, meetings with them or anything like that. I'm not sure. Sorry, I'm not sure what you mean. I think you and Amanda had met with Diane Dieter at one point, and one of the things you had mentioned sort of reporting back from that was uh, us weighing in a little bit on how, what kind of events they planned for each year. Oh. So I wasn't sure if that meant we were going to start having a role in things like their winter welcome or any other major events that they have, because obviously that that would impact our, our event planning if you know they're going to be open to us being regularly engaged in anything like that, or if there's some other process in mind in terms of their events. Do you want to yeah. be involved in the Winter Welcome? Sorry, what was that? I was going to say, do, you, do we want to be involved in the Winter Welcome? We, we, we're starting I think I need a weather forecast first, so, you know. <laughs> I so the yeah so the the conversation with Diane was that um, looking for ways for was focused around how do we how do we engage residents and engage CPUN um, uh, in the efforts of the MCA and and a suggestion I had made was um, if you are doing an event that uh, is sustainability focused or if you are planning an event that it is that is DEI focused, that we have committees of people that are often have, uh, that always have resident perspective and often have legitimate expertise in the in that field that can, that can help to, um, to make them, to sort of make the most of those events to help gotcha. make them better, help, help improve them. So it was really more of an olive branch to, to Diane to say, this is a way in which if you are looking to engage CPUN, if you're looking to engage the residents on these sorts of things that we can, we can potentially collaborate. Um, gotcha. Nothing was formalized. Um, it's worth me following up with her um, again, just to, to reiterate that interest and specific examples um, or opportunities um, are always a good way to help kind of nudge things along in that regard. Um, Amanda, would you, yeah, Amanda, would you characterize it any differently or add anything to that? Yeah, I don't recall there being a, a specific um, time or, or event around which she had declared that they would reach out and, and do something. Yeah. I think it's just a, um, I think that you were very um, effective in, in communicating everything that you just summarized, that there's both expertise and willingness to contribute among people who are on committees and on the board here, um, and it would behoove them to harness that. Okay, so, so my reason for asking was, um, from an outreach standpoint, if we're going to be more active in being present in the community, uh, whatever MCA events are most uh, you know, popular or most broadly attended would probably be good ones for us to show up with those pieces of literature. Um, and I believe the winter welcome is coming up. And I wasn't sure though, uh, if, you know, if there's other ones we should think about and, but we can discuss that sort of in committee and Jack, I would definitely welcome your thoughts. And maybe we, you and I can, can converse by email about what the, you know, top two or three things would be. Our first attempt was rained out, unfortunately. Uh, thank you yeah. to everybody who showed up and got wet. Um, <laughs> but our first uh, attempt at, at being more present in the community got rained out uh, pretty quickly after it started. Um, but we're now equipped for being able to go to events. So I think it would be good to know. Um, the one thing we were missing was some sort of piece of literature to explain who the hell we are. Um, so to have that printed you know, in advance of an event would be great. So Mark, I'll tell you, people show up to things where there's beer. So, if, you know, the beer festival, 
you know, a lot of people, a concerts where we sell beer, a lot of people, you know, a farmer's market where we sell whiskey and wine and beer, right? Those, those are where we see the most people, um, just to put that out there. Yeah, yeah, but you seem to I, have beer at almost everything. So I wasn't sure if there was one beer event <laughs> versus another beer event that was a little more popular. But depends on the quantity of beer. The more beer, okay. the more people. Okay. And, and, and that, I, that I don't mind saying that I'm confident that Diane would welcome Seapun to have a table. You know, being present is not the same thing as influencing the agenda, but um, if if we're willing to sort of treat those as two separate and both and both valuable things, uh, uh, things like that winter event, I'm sure we can yeah be present for. And, and we we can you know take this back to committee and figure out what makes sense. I I don't want us to try to be at every event unless we have somebody who just wants to be there for the beer. Um, that's fine. I'm I'm not that big a beer drinker to to be able to go to all of them, but uh, I think you're very funny. What's that? <laughs> I'm at every event, you know, just it's my job. So happy. Okay, so let's print them and give them all the jack. And then you can just at every event hand them out for us. So I'll do it. I got you. Hey, if I could jump in real real quick. Um, uh, Yeah, I've been at some of those events helping from the CPBA side. And um, it really helps if you have something to get people to come talk to you. Um, and with the with the winter welcome, the CPBA has done passed out hot chocolate, which is a little bit of work, but it's tremendously popular on a cold night. And mm-hmm. I don't know that the CPBA is going to is going to have a booth this year. So that could be a great way to connect with the community to raise awareness to um, CPine and what we're doing, and get them signed up for the email newsletters and that sort of thing. It is some work though, but it well, could I'll be valuable. I'm sorry, Jeff. I'll tell you that the Winter Well this year is being completely reimagined. We are collaborating with an events production company, Hobnob Events. They're the same folks that uh, manage uh, our farmers market. Uh, they are well known in the events business. They they own and operate uh, farmers markets across town, along with the Denver October Festival, lots of beer, um, and uh, a whole bunch of other different festivals and events throughout the city. You know, Cherry Creek Arts Festival, all that stuff that they do. So um, I, the, the winter welcome is going to look completely different this year, and it's going to have a new feel to it. Um, I don't know all the details because I don't get invited to those meetings until like right before the event's about to happen. But just know that uh, ex- don't expect the same event you've seen in the past. So I guess the question would be, oh, there, would we, if we wanted to do something, have a booth there, could we? But is it going to be, is it going to be a cost to it? Because I know it's not cheap for the CPBA. Just, just things to keep in mind if we want to do something like this. Yeah. Well, we'll yeah, why don't we take that one back to committee, Mark, and uh, see where we can get. Anything else on uh, committee updates? Anything the board can help a committee with? Well, I would love to, uh, on the sustainability front, at some point have a conversation with the MCA about um, some of their efforts, but that's... Uh, uh, I don't know, Jack, maybe, maybe that's another thing that you and I need to talk about. So I think I need to buy you a burrito again. <laughs> well, I don't know if I already pitched our lawnmower suggestion and I got told no. So, you know, maybe you're more persuasive than me. Yeah, well, uh, I think maybe they just need to hear it from lots of different people. So were you talking about robot lawnmowers or just electric ones? Uh, you know, just using ones that aren't noisy and, you know, gas stinky and stuff. Well, I appreciate you pitching that. So uh, we can talk further over a beer or a burrito or whatever about uh, next steps there. Mark, do you go to the uh, delegate meetings? I am there. No, I don't. I don't. I don't know when they are. They're, I don't get I an email. They're usually, they're the, are they the third Wednesday, Jeff, I think, I at think. noon? Because I mean, that would be a direct place to just go and, um, and give feedback directly to everything that they're, um, that they're saying through like existing open channels. So the idea is we have delegates, but we go to their meetings and talk to them at their meetings. It's a public meeting. I mean, you know, I mean, it's just like this, but it's their information. I went to one once and I didn't remember, I mean, it was a long time ago, but I don't remember there being a public comment period, but it might be different now too. Because there isn't, there hasn't been a public comment period. And I, and there, I'm trying to think if there's even a chat, I go. Most of the time. 
there is a public comment period, but you have to sign up for it in advance um, on our website. Um, and they're only members, which I think we're all members, um, are allowed to give public comment. Remember, the MCA defines a member as an individual that owns property in the neighborhood. So there are some caveats that you have to meet and you have to sign up ahead of time. Um, so not many people or anyone ever does that. That's why it doesn't appear to be uh, there, but it's always an agenda item. Just no one ever signs up. Yeah, generally when you don't make it easy to sign up, people don't. So. Yeah. We've, uh, I, I will look out for it though, because I'm good at finding that stuff. Thanks, Amanda and Jack. Um, well, I think we should uh, keep moving because we've got what I think will be kind of a lengthy discussion around the bylaw changes coming up next. Um, uh, just perspective again for everybody, what we're trying to do is put together a, a bundle of bylaw changes that we um, secure 100, anything that we want to uh, put to a community vote, we need to secure 100 petition signatures for each of these uh, items um, by our October meeting so that we can announce it at a community, uh, excuse me, announce a community vote 30 days later, which would be our, our November meeting. We've already done what we need to do for the former president role. The two topics that were broached last time that we'd like to try to get some resolution on a go forward plan with tonight are um, Aurora representation and uh, the size of the board, specifically uh, the possibility of increasing it. Um, Last time, and I'm going to start with the Aurora representation, we seem to be moving in a direction of, uh, of supporting the idea of increasing our footprint to include the, um, the Aurora area. Um, so Brian went ahead and um, proactively created what the bylaw change would look like. You can see it here in red, um, but we didn't really all kind of get on board with this idea. There was some um, hesitancy uh, around um, making sure that we are clear about what our obligations are to those residents and what, um, what we will and won't do as a Denver RNO for Aurora, for our Aurora represent, uh, residents. Um, would anyone characterize it differently than that? Um, I wonder if if anyone wants to speak to that point about their concerns about um, about what our obligations would be to uh, Aurora residents, at, e even remaining a Denver RNO. Well, I can. So I um, don't have any comments prepared, uh, and I know that I. This would have been something that I said last time. Uh, so a, a mix of concerns would be um, just having an expectation from residents in Aurora that we can do more than we really can do as a board that is made up of mostly people who are not constituents of the people who represent the people who live in Aurora. Mm -hmm. Like we don't, we wouldn't have the same contact with elected representatives and um, uh, and, and support uh, that, that they would if we were to mentor them and work with them on forming an RNO specific to the blocks of residents in this community who are in Aurora. I think that the strongest representation that they could have would be to, to form an RNO made up of Aurora residents in Central Park and for us to meet jointly for all of our meetings, but for them to exist independently, because I think that there would be more strength in that, but then for us to like partner on all that makes sense. Amanda, if I could respond just really quickly, I think um, I don't see why it would have to necessarily be a separate RNO as opposed to a subcommittee. Uh, like we have a number of committees if there was an Aurora committee of CPUN and then let the Aurora residents decide how, you know, how to the extent to which they would need to engage or how to engage with their elected representatives, like through CPUN or, or bringing them into the meetings. But it seems that they would know best what their needs are.
any other thoughts pro or con here that anyone wants to share I would just say, I don't think this is an issue unique to this neighborhood. We had asked um, Alexandra if there were other neighborhoods that had multiple RNOs. And she said, yes, there were. And that people in those neighborhoods are able to join both RNOs, but the RNOs don't mimic each other. They serve different functions. So I don't actually see why, why we would want to copy what the Aurora RNO is doing, but I do think we should be inclusive in that anyone who lives on the Aurora side has the ability, the equal ability to either join the Aurora RNO, to join the Aurora RNO and the CPUN RNO. I would say we just need to be careful um, with what we're willing to cover and just make that clear because we really want to adjust things that, <clears throat> excuse me, that pertain to Central Park. And so um, I think if we're clear on that, then, you know, we don't necessarily need to be talking about all things Aurora. But I do believe that since um, these residents are um, in the boundaries of Central Park, that they should have the ability to participate on issues uh, pertaining to Central Park. So um, I, I just think we re just really need to kind of make sure that we're clear on what we will take on and what we won't take on. I think the, the concern I have is to what extent do we want need to be able to answer that question before we put this forward to the community for a vote. We can say um, that we'll we'll figure that out, um, but I don't think that that's fair to voters um, to to trust us to figure it out um, because that's a significant implication of 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 what the vote how they might vote. Right? Do you know what I mean, Mandel? Yeah, I certainly understand that you want to work out any details, and I think that's probably what this conversation is about. Um, but on the other hand, like the reason it came up in the first place is because of our neighborhood is called Central Park, and we share a lot of the resources um, between the residents in Aurora, as well as the Central Park residents of Denver. And so um, I, I hear what you're saying. I, I, I just think that, um, you know, I, I, I would caution to say that we shouldn't let them participate because of Aurora and because we can't do all things Aurora. Um, so that's all I'm saying here. Mm -hmm. But I, I definitely get your point. Um, I'll sort of throw a proposal out there and see, and we can, everyone can react how, to it, how at least you fit. In my, despite the fact that RNOs are city sponsored in a way, uh, entities, in my experience on the board, um, the overwhelming majority of the work that takes place or that this group does happens within the boundaries of Central Park and not between Central Park and the city. Um, if we're gonna represent the residents of Central Park, I do believe that all residents of Central Park should be allowed to participate. Um, if we value their input, which I know that we do, they should have an opportunity to participate in this board. Um, I also think that um, we, as a Denver RNO, um, we can, we can fairly say that for city, Aurora city business, um, given that what less than a single digit percentage of homes are in, are in Aurora, that Nano is a RNO that um, those residents can look to for Aurora um, city business. If I were to make an exception and where I might want to invite Aurora city officials into our 
um, regular community partners, for example, it would be Aurora Police, because specifically um, there has been a tremendous amount of confusion about who's what police department you contact and who you can um, uh, should go to based on your address. And because those are emergency uh, situations that people that pertain to safety. Um, and I'd like to suggest that um, we incorporate uh, Aurora Police um, as we do Denver Police and then defer to Nano for other city functions and otherwise operate just like we do, which is again, working within the boundaries of the Central Park community um, and representing all, represent, all, all residents. I think that makes really good sense. And I think we could stand a benefit um, to have a relationship with Aurora Police Department as well, because there is often some overlap um, between the two areas. So uh, I think that's an excellent idea. Um, can, can I jump in for a second and forgive me sure. if this has really been asked and answered. I'm trying to think if it has, and I, I don't think it has, but I could be wrong. Um, you know, working on college campuses for a number of years, we would see groups who have some amount of power would say, hey, we're going to do something for this other group that has less power. Uh, and, you know, they would go forward with good intentions. But the reality is that group that had less power was like, we don't want you to speak for us. If you want to come to us and see what we need, um, then we would, we would appreciate that conversation. So I'm saying that to say, have we fully gone to, as, as much as I think this is a good idea and I like what we're talking about, have we gone to these residents to really hear from them for, for what, they, um, what they would like for their, uh, our role to be with them? Uh, before we move too far forward, I think have we really gotten and heard from the, the voices of those people? No, uh, we have not contacted Aurora representative uh, residents um, specifically. Um, I think to the point that um, I, I'm sorry, I, I forget who made it earlier. I think it's it's primarily an issue of access. Well, I think what we're proposing here is that nothing be taken away from you that you just have this additional option if you want to participate in the CPUN board. They already have the nano RNO that serves the same function as we do relative to the city of Denver, but for Central Park specific um, uh, events, programming, whatever the case might be, you have this additional um, outlet. Yeah. I mean, I, I do think it's a good, you know, generally a good idea. I do think it would be welcome. Um, I think past history has taught me it's really important to make sure that um, those were, were working for fully feel like they have a voice in the, in the process. Uh, I see Liz's hand raised. Yeah, I, I just wanna share from the DEI committee. Um, there was the, she's since moved out of the neighborhood, but one of the original co-chairs is was Dion. Um, and I believe she had wanted to actually join the CPUN board last year uh, and was unable to because she lived in the Aurora side. So that's actually a very specific and real example of somebody from the Aurora side who wanted to engage um, with CPUN by joining the board and was unable to because of the bylaws. So I just want to remind folks kind of that context. And so then she served on the DEI committee because there were no restrictions for that. But, but this is a specific resident who was excluded because of the bylaw. Yeah, I was actually going to bring that up as well. Um, and Jeff, I don't think that we're proposing any solutions or proposing to do anything specific. We are just uh, opening the doors and, uh, and allowing the residents to participate. So I don't, I don't see it as we're we're coming in to actually, uh, you know, do something that we need to first consult with people about before we make those changes. 
Yeah. Yeah, I, I would add a second to what Jamal just said because I think, you know, our mission is mostly around educating people and keeping them informed, and um, you know, to me that means we have a relatively limited set of requirements about what we do. We just, but I think that looking forward to what our role is going to be going forward, given what it's been in the past, is in part looking at where there's new developments and people being as engaged and informed about that as they can be. Uh, and there's two areas once we run out of land in Central Park, Denver, where there's going to be new developments that we'll probably uh, be weighing in on. And one of those is already around Stanley and Aurora. Um, I think it'll help us if we are representing some residents in that area. Uh, the other is probably Commerce City, but nobody lives in that section that takes Sporting Goods Park yet, so we can't really annex anything up there. So I would say, I think this makes sense to just move forward with because um, in, hopefully we'll create an opportunity for somebody from that area to join our board and take the lead on making sure their area has a voice. Um, if nobody from that area steps up, I kind of feel like it's not really incumbent on the rest of us Denver folk to speak for Aurorans. Aurora, I don't know what their short name would be for playing mm -hmm. Denverites, but whatever it is, um, Aurorians. Um, and, you know, but we'll give them the opportunity to so that they're, we're opening an invitation for them to be involved and engaged with us. And if that doesn't happen, then I don't think we'll be in big trouble or anything. So. Yeah, I'm fine with this. I just felt like I needed to put the question out there. Yeah, I appreciate that, Jeff. I'd like to keep some of the language that Liz used um, and wrap it into my concern, but reframe it as a long-term plan. And that be that like the, anyone who joins um, representing Aurora, we have it as a long-term option, should they want to roll off and be a different RNO that we would fully support that, uh, like through the Aurora Committee of CPUN. Um, but if there's not interest in being independent, then they would remain part of CPUN as a, as a committee or a regular board member. But then we would support any, any efforts that they wanted to take to like to become an independent RNO, but, um, but that wouldn't, do you think that needs you'd like that explicitly stated somewhere? Maybe not explicitly, just understood. Yeah. Yeah. I I, I don't think CPUN's in the business of telling anybody that they can't form an RNO, right? We didn't stop those East Bridgers from creating their separate East Bridge RNO way back then. Right. <laughs> they just failed. So it was okay. And and I can understand why. I can conceive of a scenario, Amanda, why uh, a group of Aurora residents might deem that necessary. And if, if so, then they're, they're more than welcome to, to do so. Then they could have two letters for whatever, you know, yep. initiatives they had, one from us, one from them, maybe one from Nano too. Yeah. But, I, mean, I, I can see that it would be harder to start from scratch. And so like as a seed committee within CPUN might make the most sense for that if it's a long-term goal. But if that's not even a long term goal, that would that would be that would be fine. But it, I mean, I think that that's something that we could just have in our minds up front that that might be what works best for them in the long run. Sure. Any other thoughts on this before we we vote? I'll, I'll just conclude it, but then by saying um, the two things that really stuck in my mind um, long before this was got to the point where we were talking about it as a um, as a board where the the, the uh, Dion Williams wanting to join the board and not being able to um, and the rename effort that we allowed Aurora residents to participate in that vote as members of our as residents in our community but but that otherwise they don't participate in our board and that just didn't sit right um, and I think this is an, a, a good step to take to rectifying those two um, examples of, of, uh, of exclusion. So um, do we Hey, have... Jeff, Jeff, aren't we, aren't we just saying this would have the, <clears throat> have the board just go out to find, to see if we get a hundred signatures, that's all we're doing? That's all we're doing now. I just wanna make sure that the board, uh, I wanna sort of, 
vote that is that the step we want to take next. So I'll I'll motion that. Is that how you say that? that? Vote to motion that. <laughs> I don't know. I move. Can, can someone second it? I'll second it. Do we have any um, objections? I'm not objecting. I'm asking for a clarification. So right. would the signatures on this item have to come exclusively from residents of Denver? Yes. Yes. That's my question too. Current members. Current members, yeah. It would have to come from current members. Um, we should, I think Jay noticed uh, that, that maybe cities of Denver and Aurora, Mark, we might want to modify that language. Or it could say city of Denver and city of Aurora. Sure. But well, if we're doing modifications, south at the bottom should not be capitalized if northwest and east are not. Oh dear, we might want to brush this up a little bit. <laughs> hey, I, I, did a draft. I did a draft. I no, I'm just I'm giving you a hard time, Brad. I'm sorry. I will note. I will note. Oh, that there's legally, some periods and stuff too. I will note that legally, uh, we are not in the city of Denver. We are in the city and county of Denver, and it is the city of Aurora. If we want to go with their legal state descriptions, not that anyone cares. No, we should get it right. I care, Jack. I care and too, you, Jack. And you care. <laughs> Let's I, get it I right. officially don't care. <laughs> oh, uh, Bring Mark a burrito and a beer. <laughs> so I'm not hearing any objections. We'll get this language cleaned up. Um, Brian, thank you for doing that. And then we will uh, put a request out uh, to the community for 100 uh, petition signatures. Yes, it does have to be current members. Um, and then the I would next just one. like to, to thank you for setting the precedent that if we're going to use our uh, CPUN email system for collecting signatures that we do actually have a vote first and yeah. don't just uh, have any board member decide I want to do a petition and I'm going to send it out. So thank you. Yeah. Uh, and thank you to everybody for that. Uh, let's uh, go to the second one, which is the size of our board. Um, Mark, if you don't mind going to the next slide. Oh, right. No, that's me. Sorry. So this came up last month. Seat, uh, Central Park has grown massively since the 15 board seats were established. There's obviously a lot of different neighborhoods now with a lot of different stages of development and therefore different needs. And we finally, in the last couple of years, had more applicants than seats on a quasi-regular basis. I think the question now becomes how many. Um, the executive uh, officers or executive committee kind of had a quick email exchange about it. Uh, the merits the merits of a small increase versus a large um, increase. I think the, the, the small increase was, let's make sure that um, before we have too big of a board that everyone on the board that we have is committed and engaged and that we're not um, inviting um, uh, disengaged board members taking up spots. Um, the larger side on, on of the spectrum being more of the um, let's get more people involved. Let's not have to go through this again later. Let's, let's, uh, let's make sure that people who want to participate um, can participate, um, if I'm just sort of succinctly trying to describe the, um, uh, the, the opinions there. Does anyone that was on that think, email thread want to, want to represent or advocate for? Jeff, here? I think, I think that, I think the question was also manageability of the board and just, yeah. if it gets too big, um, can we physically manage that many board members and keep, and as you said, not have just have people taking up seats on the board, um, but that there are board members that are engaged. So, mm -hmm. does anyone want to advocate for a number? Make a pitch. I have a I have a question. Um, oh, sorry. As yeah. well, um, regarding the having had more applicants, do you have an idea of how many more applicants we would have had if we didn't have the name change? Because looking at the number of participants that show up for our board meeting, I mean, we had 10 times the number of participants mm -hmm. showing up on our board meeting during the entire name change process. A lot of people found out who CPUN was before, you know, when we were back, when we were son. And we are back down to kind of pre-name change numbers. 
And so I wonder how many, how, what, how much effect the name change had on people wanting to be the board, be on the board. And now that everything has calmed down, how many do we, do we actually still have that much interest in people being on the board? That's a great uh, question and point, uh, Sandra. Uh, I think with all of our most recent um, board members, um, the, the name change came up as a, a motivating factor in some form or fashion. Um, that's absolutely true. Um, with this most recent round, I'll just say um, we had the one open seat, which has now been filled by Liz. We had one other person reach out to us about it who subsequently decided not to, not to proceed. So I, I will, I would like to, to make a pitch for at least 19. Um, the reason I feel like it, it's important to have more uh, is actually goes back to our strategic planning discussion earlier in the year, where I feel like um, not only do we have many neighborhoods to cover, but some of those neighborhoods like East Bridge is actually considered one neighborhood, even though it's much larger than some of the little smaller neighborhoods. Um, and then there are other sort of sub constituencies that I don't feel like we're able to represent um, with 15 or 17 board members. Um, whatever the number is that we're set at uh, kind of puts a cap on what recruiting we can do. So for example, we don't have anybody in North End or Beeler Park, I don't believe right now. Um, and those are our newest areas where we really need to do some recruiting, but we don't have a slot. We can't add anybody to our board. Technically, we could add people to our committees, but historically, we've really never had much luck there. Um, and with regard to the concern of about having too many, shall we say, inactive board members, um, you know, we've had many years in the past where we couldn't even fill the 15 slots and had inactive board members. I think given the size of our neighborhood, it's actually gotten easier to recruit because, uh, you know, when we hit 15, we've probably doubled in size as a community since we, we first got to the 15 number. And we're not talking about going to 30. Um, we're talking about going to maybe 21. So a increase of, uh, dang it, I didn't do the math earlier, sorry. Um, of, you know, six seats. So 40% when we've, you know, maybe more than doubled in size and have more to grow. Um, we don't have to have 21 seats filled as well. If we don't have good candidates, we don't have to uh, necessarily appoint them to the board. But I do feel like we've hit the point where we're going to be missing out on, on good people and the ability to represent under or unrepresented groups if we don't substantially add to the size of our board. I don't think we can cover all of the groups that we want to and all of the neighborhoods um, without at least 19 at this point. Um, 17, I just don't think is anywhere near enough and definitely not 15. I think I would say, um, Mark, I think you're making good points. Um, makes sense to me. Um, I would say if, let's say we did go to 19, I would say, can we go to 17? Consider going to 19 the next year, but assess like how well, how quickly we're integrating the additional two seats and then you know, if it's successful, we, we do 19 the next year, um, you know, and then we could assess from there if we should go to 21. So something where it's a process rather than, you know, let's let's open up four more um, seats, which I, I, don't, I don't think you're saying that, you know, necessarily, Mark, but rather than opening up four more seats where we're going to integrate four additional spots, well, feels like a challenge in itself. I agree with if Jeff, I and I and I also I had originally said when we had this um, conversation with the executive committee that I was in favor of 17. I believe that it needs to be incremental, and we don't do what the MCA <coughs> does, which is you know you have a representative from each neighborhood, conservatory green, and so forth. So if you are talking about a broader representation of the entire community, we'd have to have a process for doing that. Um, and it's not that we shouldn't, um, but that's certainly going to take some thought about how we would recruit people um, so that we are covering the whole neighborhood. Um, and I agree with what you just said, Jeff, about doing this incrementally. I think it's a smarter, safer thing to do. So in the past, when we had in the bylaws 15, 
um, originally. I mean, it is now and it has been for, for a long time. We didn't have to just if we if we made it the bylaws say we could have up to 21. That doesn't automatically mean we have to allow up to 21. And we never we never did. We went mm -hmm. when we had people available to go up to that level. Um, just like earlier this year, we were only at 14. Um, now, if we only do 17, um, which group do you want to leave out? North End, Beeler Park, Aurora, or what? Because historically, we have always had tried to have his, uh, geographic representation. That has been part of the discussion when I've been on committees figuring out who the candidate should be if there was anything. It was, where don't we have representation? Um, and my concern is at 17, we can't add in all three of those areas and add more representation for people who are in apartments and add in more um, ethnic and racial diversity. You know, we, we don't have the numbers for that. We, it's, it's just, you know, we have to then collapse groups and say, okay, well, we can get two out of these three neighborhoods, uh, each of which probably has unique issues and we're only giving them one slot. And maybe if possibly we can add some, you know, racial or ethnic diversity to the board on top of it. Like it, it just makes that so much harder if we only add those two slots. And I don't see the value of having to go through the bylaws change process every couple of years just to fix that when we can fix it now once, not have to go through another bylaws vote on it ever, you know, potentially again, and then as a board decide when it's time to expand the size of the board. So are you saying we could do a bylaws change up to state 21, but we basically would recruit, target a more inter incremental yes. growth process? Exactly. Exactly what I'm saying. So we could yeah, say, hey, we want to fill these, you know, three holes we have, right? Like, you know, I don't know, especially once the census numbers come out uh, in the in the spring, you know, we're going to be able to know how many Asian Americans live in our neighborhood and do we have any representation there? How many uh, Hispanic Americans live in our neighborhood and do we, what kind of representation do we have there? We'll be able to have numbers and say, how low are we in these things? And I know we're also really low on people who live in apartments. And I think that's a shame. And I think we should be able to do something about it. But if we only add two seats, I don't think we can. And I would just, Mark, I don't disagree with that. I just, I, I think my comment is um, a board getting over 20 um, becomes somewhat unmanageable. And that's the only thing that I would say that there's, there's also a chance for, you know, redistribution over time. I, I, I would say if we went to 19, um, we could get to a point where we would have the, the right diversity mix. Yeah, I think my concern would be if we have the ability to have 21 and we get six more people showing up and, and saying that they want to be on, has there ever been a time in history where, you know, uh, we had, uh, let's say, 15 people to fill, but we only chose 13? Um, is that is that realistic? That yeah, uh, it has it has happened, Mandel. Okay, so so we had somebody show up and they just didn't vote on letting them in. Yeah, yes. Okay, well that would be my concern. I just I just don't want it to be a situation where, you know, we have the capacity for twenty one, and the only reason that we're not filling that capacity is we're saying, okay, well, there, we got 21, but really we're only going to seek 17 or 19. I, I think I would go with 19 um, after hearing Mark's argument. Uh, originally, I was thinking 17 because I think too many people can be hard to manage and, you know, you want to get a level of commitment from people joining. So um, I, I would move from 17 to 19 just, just for that reason. Yeah, I think I'm in the same camp. It, added, going to 19 requires the board to exert some discipline in terms of how it goes about recruiting um, new board members. 
who it chooses to bring on to the board, but I'd rather the board have that extra responsibility and the capacity that it needs to fill to 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 get better representation than um, to sort of self impose this restriction on ourselves that also restricts our ability to to reach different audiences. Um, as long as we're willing to say that we're going to be disciplined about enforcing our standards for the board and and what um, what makes for a good board member, then I'd rather have the extra uh, the extra seats so that we can put them to good use. Um, and so I, I think I would feel comfortable with 19 as well. I move I move that we um, have a second item on the bylaw uh, petition to increase the board maximum maximum board seats to 19. I'll second that. Any objections? And, I, and and it's almost eight thirty, so I was trying to move us along because yeah, we still have to approve the budget. Any objections? Okay. Uh, real quick. Sorry, I was on mute. I'm sticking with seventeen. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Carol. I think the eyes have it in this instance. Um, and so we will uh, move forward with that. Um, we quickly need to get together the language around um, uh, the, the, excuse me, the petition language together for both of these issues to accompany the, um, uh, the former president one. Is, is anyone willing to take a stab at one or the other? So Jeff, I have a question about the former president one. Uh, sure. I don't know if former president is the best terminology. Perhaps we should use immediate past president seems a little more specific in my mind. Um, but I don't know if that ship has already sailed. Yeah, and I think the bigger issue is that it doesn't necessarily have to be the immediate past president. Uh, that immediate past president could choose not to participate. And then a, another former president of the board could step into the role. So perhaps past president would be a better, I just former seems like, you know, you've retired and you're in your rocking chair. <laughs> um, and I'm just thinking that past is like they were, but they've passed now. I don't know. I'm, maybe I'm okay. Yeah. It, let's let, we can talk about that, Jack, just in the interest of time. Um, uh, I don't think it substantively changes what we have to put to the, to the community for a vote, but we can take a look at that while we're looking at the language for the others. Yeah, um, absolutely. I'm just definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Jeff, I'll Jeff, I will correct the grammar on the first one. Sorry, Jay. Um, and and I'll pull those other two sections together and circulate it. OK. Also, I think that it starts at Fulton, not Iola. Uh, we correct. checked. Did. Jack, did you miss that? Because you approved what I sent out. No, I said Fulton. Did you? Okay, yeah. that's my my bad then. I'll fix it. Uh, do you want to quickly look, take a look at the budget, Brian? Sure. Uh, it's it, the only change um, that we had was to add the DE and I event, um, and so I, you know, we've got that as, and we assumed it would be an offset um, from the money from the foundation. So nothing else has changed. Do we need to vote to uh, approve yes. this? Well, well, and I think I think one clarification in the past, we've always brought all invoices to the board for approval. And I think if the money is in the budget, um, we will um, we will have a report once a month and show what the expenditures are, but we won't bring them back individually if, as long as it's accounted for in the budget. Assuming there's no objections to that. Mm. Okay. So yeah, we do, we should get a motion to approve. I move to approve. Second. Second. Any objections? I think we have a budget. 
Yay. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. That's a lot of work. I appreciate you doing that. Um, so there's one more issue uh, that's, that's I, I'll actually skip this um, uh, to go to the zoning question. We are at time and I appreciate that it's late. Um, if people, I'm gonna, I, I'll need a response uh, over email on this one by the board fairly uh, quickly. Um, so I can either, we can either tough it out now and keep going, or uh, if you prefer, I'm happy to write up an email explaining the situation and um, we can, we can conduct, we can uh, talk about it there. What would people prefer? Can you provide you us doing? an overview and yeah. then we can dialogue and vote via email? Yeah, sure. Uh, Amanda originally, and then me, was approached by a resident about concerns they had about a development called Alex and Montview Plaza, which is just south of uh, Stanley Marketplace, and it runs from Montview to 22nd. It's a big multi-purpose com complex with uh, housing uh, up to six stories high, as well as parking garages and other uh, amenities. Um, I ex he was looking for uh, a letter from CPUN opposing um, uh, their building permits or their zoning um, approval uh, on a variety of different grounds. He, he has a number of, takes a number of different issues with this particular development. I explained to him that CPUN does not take a position on um, zoning matters and that NANO, given this location, which is in Aurora, um, is their better uh, registered neighborhood organization for uh, a city of Aurora it, filing issue. Uh, he asked for an opportunity to uh, persuade me. And so I spent some time talking with him and he kind of laid out his case. Um, the vast majority of the case, I have the same stance. It's, it, it's the sort of zoning um, issues that um, CPUN does not get involved in. He did make one point, however, that I thought was perhaps a little different and worthy of a potential exception from this board in terms of weighing in with a comment to the city of Aurora. And that is access to a public amenity, specifically um, Westerly Creek. Um, this development, um, because of the, the way it's built, would uh, restrict access to Westerly Creek in ways um, that are inconsistent with the development along the rest of the um, uh, 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 along the rest of Westerly Creek, there's no so there could there's no possibility of a end to end trail on that side of the creek. Access is restricted to um, one cul de sac on 22nd Avenue. There's no access via Montview um, anymore, and as a public amenity. Um, our interests are a little bit different than with a fence or with a building height. Um, uh, it's um, just like we would take an interest in um, what's going on with Stanley or with Dix at, at Westerly Creek, Westerly Creek, we would also take an interest in our, our uh, sort of friends in, in Aurora and uh, likely to be part of our, our footprint as well. So what I would propose that we discuss is not an opposition to the application, but to point out only that um, this zoning would potentially, this would, zoning would in fact disrupt access to a public amenity and speak to that issue only. I don't, I don't think it would though, Jeff. Uh, I don't think there, I, I think that the reason why you can't, I think there's a creek in the way. Um, and so it's not as you couldn't have an end to end, but I could be looking at this view could be skewing it. So um, I think I have homework. I got to go out there and look at it. Yeah, Jack, I can say that there's not a creek in the way for this section, because right now the, the part over here where it says Western Creek in the bottom left corner of the cute little picture, I believe that's all parking lot at the moment. Um, so the creek is actually to the, you know, a little bit further to the, um, to the west of, of what we have pictured here. So, um, and I didn't yeah, realize right. we were thinking of a flex office we work thing there. I mean, like that stuff's gonna fill up with our residents, I feel like. Uh, um, so that makes me even support even more trying to figure out a way to make that bike connection work so that. Yeah. Can I share my screen? 
Yeah, yeah please, Amanda. Hold on. Yeah, Mark, that's a problem if they're going to put it there. Okay, so I think what he's asking for is, can you see my mouse? Uh -huh. my, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so this line right here, so the creek is on, sorry, the trail is on the east bank here, and it has access to this playground underneath Mont View. This development is not including access to this east bank, and that's what he's asking for. So he wants through access on the east bank to connect with the access that, what's happening? <laughs> I don't know why that just happened. <laughs> oh, that's frustrating. <clears throat> Hold on now. Let me just, okay. One more time. So he wants the cul-de-sac on 27, 22nd, uh, which uh, there will be access to the creek there. Um, he wants there to then be access to Mont View from that. Trying to zoom I think there's access there currently. I think it's a dirt path and it's, I, I don't think there, it's developed at present. And so, it's not developed at present, but I think that the um, the plans have access from this cul-de-sac on 22nd down to the creek. And that's currently was... part of the plan, but then there's not access from Montview to the to the path. Yeah, that's you have to cross there. over the bridge and get it. Uh, you can get to the uh, west bank of Westerly Creek and get onto the Greenway that way. So I think his his objection is that he wants access to the east bank because that's where the throughway is for Point South. So yeah, what, I think specifically he wants that access to just essentially go along where like straight north south from where yeah, it is yeah. now because it cuts off at one point. Not that it would like go down that steep hill and you know loop around underneath or anything like that. There's there's also the matter of it encroaching on the bank right on the on that north south line amanda um where um it sort of it doesn't necessarily honor this the the removal the the distance between the development and the westerly creek land uh and instead there are private sidewalks proposed for only residents that would be the only um walkable path on for that stretch of several hundred feet of, of the creek where the development is taking place. Okay. So so I I, I drafted a letter um, so that you can re that way you can and I'll circulate that because that might be the easiest way to understand what the argument is is for you to take a look at the letter and then you can do your research into the the development itself and I'll try to provide some resources as well. Um, but there's some time sensitivity here because Aurora is going to hear this case next month, uh, about a month from now. I don't know if an exact date has been set. Um, so if you wouldn't mind taking a look at the letter and we can start a dialogue over email, uh, that would be appreciated. Jeff, do we have the Aurora, like the, the, the case number so that I can get yeah. the actual architectural plans? Because with the diagram you have here that is from the front porch. Um, yeah. I, I need a little, little more detail. Yeah, we've got, thanks to this resident, we have lots and lots of documents. Okay, I would love to take a look at those as well. Sure. Thanks everybody, I appreciate you spending a few extra minutes. I'll, I'll get that circulated uh, in the next day or so. Before we go, let me just say, welcome to the board, Liz. We're excited to have you. <laughs> oh, yes. thank you very much. Yep, welcome. Welcome to the board. All right. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, and everyone. welcome, Liz. Thanks. And happy birthday again, Sandra. Yeah, happy birthday. Hope you're happy happy birthday. birthday, Sandra. <laughs> welcome, Liz. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Take care. Bye. Bye, Bye everybody.